Hello, I'm Michael Bott. And I'm Rupert Soskin, and welcome to another Prehistory Guys interview. You know what, Rupert? I love archaeology. I think we both love archaeology, don't we? We do. We love all the data. We love all the analysis. We love all the detail, you know, that stuff that comes from uh, professional ar archaeology digs and so on and so forth. And we love all that fleshing out of, uh, of the people. But, I mean, the whole thing we started off with, you know, was just loving being with the stones themselves. I don't think there'd be a Standing With Stones film if it hadn't been for that thing of the you know the mystery of standing in a field with a standing stone. it's very true it's very true there is a distinct relationship that you can have with any site you visit it's true so the fact is we don't have any problem at all with talking to people who just do that who just love the stones for themselves yes it's uh, in fact, do you know what? I think it's actually an important thing because a lot of the time we're talking to archaeologists who are busy working in the field, as you said, you know, whether it's digging stuff up or uh, or laboratory work, we're painstakingly extracting information from all sorts of things. But it is important that we also talk to people who just have that passion and uh, relationship with the sites themselves. It's true. So it is with deep joy, deep pleasure, that we can introduce to you Elizabeth Dale. Elizabeth Dale writes uh, a fantastic blog called The Cornish Bird. She, uh, do you know what? I, I love Liz's work. Uh, she, uh, the, the way she gets into the spirit of... Uh, whether it's the history or the legends or whatever, she just she uh, she writes so beautifully about the sites, and uh, yeah, recommend her blog to anybody. She started doing podcasts as well, and yeah. so it's it's a treat to get her on. She's actually you can trace her family. She can trace her family in Cornwall back as far as fifteen fifty, which yeah. uh, that's you know, that's astonishing, isn't it? Five hundred years in gives Cornwall. her a certain sense of authority, I think, about yes. the subject matter in hand, <laughs> yes. <know>, which is <laughs> which is Cornwall, not only one of our favourite places, but you know, one of the if you want to trip over standing stones and stone circles all day, it's the place to go, really. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, we had a great conversation with Lizzie about uh, prehistoric stuff and, and Cornwall. I think uh, we'd just better get on with it and uh, hope you enjoy the conversation. Let's do that thing. So, Elizabeth Dale, Cornish bird, welcome Hello. to the Prehistory Guys podcast. How's life in Cornwall this moment? Hello. It's Hello. very nice, thank you, and thank you so much for having me. That's it's okay. a great pleasure. We like Huge what you pleasure. do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. It's very I kind. Think a, a lot of people. <laughs> it's very kind. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, like uh, what you do as well. Um, well. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. But your your heritage, as it were, in Cornwall goes back quite a long way. Can you yes, say uh, I've a got bit some about creds how far there, back you know. it goes? Yeah, yeah. It's quite important in Cornwall as well to have those creds. Um, <laughs> I did uh, some research into my family tree about um, 10 years ago now, um, basically because my father was interested. Um, he comes from uh, a farming family and uh, he just uh, was interested to, you know, he knew his family history back a couple of generations, but he didn't really know where anybody was from, you know, sort of any further back. So I did some research for him and um, was able to trace... Um, Back to 1550 which was made much easier by the fact that farmers don't tend to move anywhere <laughs> <laughs> they're they're sort of you know uh quite static they, they yeah. stay uh, in one place and um so uh yeah we were able to trace them quite quite easily actually back to 1550 um where the records then start to dwindle quite significantly yeah. the written, yeah, yeah. written records yeah. so, um, so you've actually been a farming family for five, nearly 500 years yeah yeah That's there amazing. was the odd uh, the odd baker in there okay okay um a couple of generations of, of bakers 
but uh, 90% of them <laughs> were farming families and actually um, down in Penwith. Um, which right. was a, a happy coincidence for for both me and my father because we we both love that area, mm. and um, I'd always felt strangely sort of at home there, connected. I don't know, and uh, so it was lovely to actually establish the fact that the family had lived almost continuously on the same sort of um, few farms near Zena yeah. Um, yeah. for several generations until about. I think about 1860 1870 when they right. moved up um more towards falmouth which is where we are now before before we move on to some of the other stuff you were talking about your father there mm -hmm. and uh and because his his attachment to the land was very influential on you as well mm, wasn't it very much so very much so um yeah i mean he he is the 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 reason that um i'm uh interested in ancient history i suppose mm. um he uh went and visited Stonehenge for the first time, I think, when he was quite a young man um, in the maybe the late 50s, early 60s, mm -hmm. and um, was absolutely blown away by it, but in a very, very farmer-type way <laughs> in that he wanted to work out how they moved them. You know, he, he because he's such a practical person and he work, he's worked physically his whole life, the idea of how man was able to maneuver those enormous pieces of stone just you know befuddled him yeah, and yeah, um yeah. started his interest and then he um started looking into obviously sites that were closer to home and um you know when we were, were kids if we ever had uh, any time off um we didn't go you know beaching or uh, or anywhere like that we would be taken off in the car with a picnic and up onto Dartmoor, onto Bodmin Moor, or down onto the Penwith, just looking to find a great big bit of rock Ock. that uh -huh. my dad would then measure <laughs> to see yeah. how heavy it was <laughs> and try and work out how, how anybody moved it, you know? And that's, I think, where my, my interest uh, sprang from, was from through him, really. Yeah, but it went a bit further than that, didn't it? It went a bit further than just looking at Oh. Them. Yes, yeah, you're talking about his, his own personal yeah, standing indeed. stone. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So um, for the millennium, um, he decided he wanted to mark it in, uh, in some kind of way. And uh, so he went round to local quarries um, looking for the perfect stone. <laughs> Couldn't be any old stone. Uh -oh. It had to be just the right, you know, the right size and the right shape. And um, he wanted one that had no signs of of machine cutting yeah, yeah. or any yeah. kind Easy of like spot, drilling yeah. in it or anything yeah. like that he wanted a, a natural piece of stone and, and eventually found this enormous rock to which my mother went what do you think you're going to do with that <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh of course what he did do was you know dug a big hole on the, on the top yeah. of our farm and uh, erected his own standing stone which uh yeah, yeah. Which how, how, how uh, in the order of stone sizes in the whole of Cornwall, where do you reckon <laughs> your dad's uh, standing oh, it's, stone? Oh, it's, it's pretty hefty. Pretty um, hefty. We were actually only <laughs> talking about it um, a day or two ago um, because during lockdown, i um, been very fortunate that I've uh, been able to have the farm to roam around on. And I, I yeah. happened to say to him that I thought like a, a rabbit would dug a massive hole at the base of his his stone you know we were just talking about it and he, he actually mentioned then that he sunk it too deep he actually put four foot of the stone into the ground right. so there's at least oh goodness there's at least i would estimate eight or nine foot above ground <laughs> and okay. he he sunk it he thinks now too too deep in the ground because he's he like it could it could have been higher. <laughs> <laughs> but he was worried about it falling over and you know squashing someone. Do you know what? I don't doubt that's a conversation that took place in the Neolithic. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure <laughs> almost it, it guaranteed, did. isn't it? Almost yeah. guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. Or well, somebody <laughs> went and looked at it and went, "Ah, oh, I thought you were going to put it the other way around." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Lizzie, what got you into writing? Oh, what got me into writing? I have, I don't know. I mean, if you want to go way back, I, I remember writing short stories when I was at school, when I yeah. was quite young, you know, sort of seven mm -hmm. or eight years old. And, and I remember um, I, 
<laughs> you probably don't want to you're not interested in this at all, but I wrote yes, a, sto- yes, a story about mermaids. I mean, so Cornish, isn't it? I wrote yeah. a story about mermaids <laughs> and my, my primary school uh, teacher was obviously impressed with this and he read it to the rest of the class. And it wasn't as part of any lesson that we were doing. I'd just written it. Mm. And that feeling of um, having something that you had invented and written, yeah. read out to other people and, and held up as being good. Yeah. Know, yeah. I, I always remember that. And um, whether that's where it sprung from or not, I don't know. But I've always written, okay. but it wasn't until um, quite recently that mm-hmm. I started actually taking it yeah, seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, I went back to university um, when I was 30 eight um four years and um no i must be 37 um Mm. and uh (laughs) yeah so as a mature mature student i went back and studied but by um, that time you'd traveled quite a bit uh, yes yeah Yeah. i had i'd spent um about 10 years um working and and traveling abroad Mm. um with my other half Mm. um Mm -hmm. and uh yeah it was a, a fantastic time uh for me i learned an awful lot as as uh a girl who, uh, previous to that, had you know bimbled around Cornwall yeah. <laughs> for most yes. of her her, uh, her life until I was like twenty two, and then I met mm. this this chap that I fell in love with who mm. has ants in his pants to this day, um, <laughs> and so we were just uh, constantly travelling and uh, and working wherever we could, doing whatever we could. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah. So so what what was the order of things then? Because uh, okay, you you write about Cornwall uh, in the broadest sense. You don't just mm-hmm. write about the prehistorical aspects, yeah, um, that's, yeah. of it. And obviously, mm-hmm. that's what our listeners are predominantly interested in. But yeah, um, but you, you know, it, it's still it's important to note that you know you're uh, you're looking at all sorts of uh, aspects of Cornwall, including later history as well. But um, I'm just uh, trying to join the dots here because you in your travels. You visited prehistoric sites in mm. in different places. So obviously, you know the, that influence of your father in your childhood, uh, you, you know that that um, kind of set the bug going for prehistoric yes. things. But you know, particularly when people are travelling to uh, to places, uh, you know, I mean, all manner of uh, countries in, in Africa. You know that actually some of the prehistoric sites are not what people seek out. So many no. of them are not easy to no. get to. So it was that, you know, then, whether um, it was an accidental thing or a deliberate thing, and you know, how did it feature in your travels? No, it was very much a deliberate um, thing because it was something that I I was always interested in. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I should make it clear that you know, me and my my partner were not well off, so um, we would travel in the cheapest ways possible and stay in the the cheapest hotels that we could find, eat eat local food, travel on local transport. Mm-hmm. And we, when we visited a country, we didn't visit for a couple of weeks. We would visit for for much longer periods of time. You know, um, as long as we wanted. In a way, we w- would quite often go somewhere um, with no no firm date of, of when we were, were leaving. So we would just explore however much we wanted to. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I was always the one that was reading about some random place, you know, or I'd, I'd hear some random story. And, I, and because we weren't on any tight schedule, we would take the time to, to go and find those places, to go and hunt them down. Um, which is what happened with the the stone circles out in Gambia. Um, I've actually been to Gambia a couple of times. Um, I think I'm right in saying that it was the second time that we went there that we went to find the the stone circles. Um, and at, at that time, we actually were travelling overland. We'd um, gone from Spain into Morocco, Morocco to Mauritania, and then just basically down through, and we ended up then several months um, in the region going through um, Mauritania and Mali and Burkina Faso and mm. Senegal and, and Gambia and um, the circles were just something that I had read about and wanted wanted to see so yeah, um, yeah. 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 And did you take anything away from uh, that experience um, fr- from the, those any sense of I mean there is I don't know if there was any folk memory or Anything like that, no, because they're relatively that, uh, recent, those 
uh, mm, stones, yeah, although they span the... quite a broad period. They're relatively recent, aren't they? Yeah. As far as I could gather from talking to anyone um, there at the time, no one had any clue why they were there or what they were for. And we didn't, uh, we, we saw several different um, circles, um, some of them quite small, quite yeah. sort of compact, you know, the stones were very tight to each other. Yeah. But there didn't seem to be any sort of folklore about who would put them there and why, um, not that I established anyway. But Did as the... I, I said to you before, I was what struck me was was the weird um, symmetry or between yeah. those sites and the sites that I'm so f- familiar with at home, yeah, and how obviously they're completely different, obviously, yeah. but in another way that they're not. Um, yes. And yeah. yeah. How weird did the locals think you were being so fascinated with them? <laughs> yeah, we we did get a lot of sort of frowny faces as to you know <laughs> why we were wanting to go and find these things, and and um, on every occasion we we ended up walking, you know, for a long time because you know public transport in in in, uh, in Africa is <laughs> you know it is what it is, and uh, yeah. roads are, roads are not great, and uh, so we would just be bumbling through the countryside trying to find these things but they're well worth it really yeah. well worth yeah. it yeah yeah so so coming back closer to home then because one of the comments that you made uh th- that you've written about was that having traveled so widely you know that you you found that some of the uh, the best stories and the most beautiful sunsets were to be found right mm. back there at home yeah and uh, so you know from that coming back home uh, what was it that set you off on this, uh, you know, on, on your blogging mission, really? And because uh, you've travelled now, you know, you, you've written about a lot of sites, and I know you're not stopping <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a compulsion you know, now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, tell us a bit about that. You know, what what was it? You, so, you know, you, you came home and decided to start writing about um, uh, Cornish sites, or how, how did that actually kick off? Um. So I, I came home, um, cutting a long story short, I did a lot of different uh, jobs. Um, you can imagine the uh, prospects in Cornwall are, are quite limited work-wise. Um, I, I worked doing antique restoration for a couple of years. Wow. And, uh, then I I got persuaded by my other half and by a friend of mine who's a photography uh, lecturer to apply for a university degree. And the the writing became more serious through that. I'd been writing bits and pieces for like village magazines and things like that, just odds and sods of things that just interested me. Yeah. Um, so it was already there. That was what I wanted to do, but I just didn't quite know how I was going to do that. Mm-hmm. And the yeah. blog really stems out of um, starting the degree. Um, becoming more familiar with technology because you know <laughs> <laughs> that was not my strongest suit uh, mm-hmm. I felt very uh, fish out of water with all these like 20 year olds um, oh, I, I, I can tell you do. a funny story <laughs> that you, won't, you might not necessarily include but I turned up to one of my first journalism lectures with my Nokia phone <laughs> and the lecturer actually picked it up in front of the whole class and went what is this? You can't be a journalist with this. And I had to go out the next day and get a smartphone. Like, All right then. <laughs> so, but no, the, the blog the blog stem, stemmed out of um, the university degree and became a platform for me to write uh, about what I wanted to write about, basically. Yeah. yeah. So I've Rupert said before, you you write generally about Cornwall, but with a with yes. with a particular. Uh, I mean, you've got a one menu at the top of your blog page, which is ancient monuments. And uh-huh. which was the first one that you wrote about, Lizzie? I think it was Boscow and Un. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it was Boscow and Un. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that which is a good place as, um, to start. One of the first ones I visited uh- um, as a teenager. Yeah. And um, always left a, a big impression on me. Yeah. Um, it was actually when I met my other half, our first date, let's say, was I took him out on a trip round the Penwith, how how he stuck with me for 20 years, heaven alone only knows. But, you know, and that was one of the first places I took him. We went and had a picnic at Bosco Nan, which looked completely different then, uh, 
in like the year 2000 than it does now. It was much more overgrown. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, which uh, there's Much a group of uh, there's people that look after it now, aren't there? Mm. Aren't there that mm. uh, go every year and uh, take away the yeah the hay, the grass, etc. Yeah, so it, it <laughs> looks fairly manicured now. I can yeah. only imagine. Gosh, it must have been difficult to find. Back yeah, then. it was. It was. There weren't. It seemed to me that there weren't many people back back in the day. You know, mm. looking for these places. Obviously, places like Merry Maidens and Lanyon Coit um, yeah. were still. Or were very well yeah. known. Yeah. Was Bus- was um, but, Busco and uh, Un um, associated with the Druidry back then, yes, or is that yeah. yes, it was, yeah. Yeah, um, I remember being told at the time uh, that it was used. It was a used yeah, yeah. circle because they're, they're an important order, aren't they? In uh, the particular um, order in in Cornwall. I'm not familiar oh. with them. Are you talking about the Druidic French? order? Yeah. All right. Yes, uh, uh, that that centre around um, Boscoe and Un, I think yeah. I do believe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I should have looked at that before we uh, we started because <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's quite an interesting point. Early uh, photographs of Boscoe and Un tend to have quite a lot of uh, dr- druids um, uh, amongst them. If I you do look remember around. being yeah. told. Uh, yeah, yeah, back in the the late nineties, that it was it was being used. Yeah. Um, mm. But I, I never sort of got involved in that scene, I suppose. But <laughs> uh, there, no. there was often, and there still is often, um, little tokens left at the base of the leaning stone. Yeah. Oh, sure. I don't know yeah. if anything was there yes. when, when you guys have visited, but there's often yeah, pr- you know, little pebbles much. and flowers. Yeah. and. Yeah. I have an impression, I seem to remember, <coughs> that one of the earliest places that you wrote about was the, the, the longest road. There's a there's a track. Um, oh no, the oldest. The, the oldest, oldest road. road. Yeah. Oh, so, yes. did I say longest? Yes. No, I meant longest. oldest. Yes. <laughs> that would be silly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that only... is that is one of my early ones. Yeah. yeah. And that that happened uh, very coincidentally. It's a um, known as the Giant's Head, Hedge. Hedge. Sorry. Yeah. And um, I read about it somewhere, and as I often do <laughs> on a day off, decided to get in my car and go and see. You know if i could find it and i definitely the way you do yeah mm. yeah and uh i i found on a map you know this um section of it that i thought that i might be able to access you know from the road or you mm. know because there was no sort of real public sort of path yeah. bit that i wanted to see so i was driving around and trying to find it and this and that and going up and down you know you can imagine the very tight little lanes you know with the high hedges yeah. and then i'm yes. stopping yes. getting out of the car trying to see where i was and uh, I pulled in to this sort of um, little lay-by, I had my map out, and I had a tap on the window. And so I wound my window down, and, and this uh, real strong <laughs> Cornish accent went... In the middle of nowhere, went, you think you're alone. <laughs> 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 you're yeah. never alone. Yeah, the no, beginning. Um, and this guy, he, he went, uh, if you're going down here, you're definitely lost. <laughs> and i went well i'm hoping i'm not and i explained to him what i was looking for and he actually said he was the farmer that owned the land uh that you know had this section of the the, the roadway on it and he said yeah. like i've farmed here for however many years and no one has ever asked me <laughs> where this thing is and i was like yeah, yeah that sounds about right that sounds about <laughs> And that, um, yeah. very fortunately for me, he was like, yeah, go ahead. You know, if you go up the road, you know, you'll, see, you'll, you'll see a gateway. And he said, there's some sheep in the field, but don't worry about those. And, you know, and he basically direct me, directed me to where I could find it. And it was the bizarrest place. I mean, yeah. you were in, in the field and you reached the sort of bottom hedge of the field. And then it just dropped away like a huge, great drop oh, really? in the ground yeah. um, because it's just so sunken. Yeah, it right. was incredible. Uh, and we, yeah. we are talking prehistoric here when they say the oldest uh, road. It runs for about 10 miles um, from oh, wow. Leren to Lou, and it's estimated to be about 4,000 years old, which is okay. incredible. That's what I thought. I wasn't going to leap yeah. in, but yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. Do you know what springs to mind is the fact that Cornwall is particular in that you, if, if you're a you know, stone seeker or something... Mm. It's mm. one of the few places that you can still go 
go and seek out something obscure and have a really good adventure at the same time. <laughs> meet, yeah. uh, meet the local farmers, for instance. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That and I kind think of the, place. the one thing we have on our side as well is, um, despite what you know, local media has been saying about Cornwall, um, we are a friendly lot. You know, we we are very welcoming. And have media actually, been saying otherwise? Uh, we've, yeah, we've there's only been ever quite had a lot good of times in Cornwall. Well, yeah. there's been a lot of stuff recently about the fact that Cornwall hasn't been welcoming visitors. Um, right. during the, the coronavirus out, outbreak. But, you know, no, anyway. No. But that's yeah, the point. But I, I think that, you know, Cornish people, as a general rule, want to make sure mm. that anyone that visits yeah, yeah. has a good time. And, uh, yeah, we're, I think a fairly welcoming lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in, I think that the Cornish love anyone who is interested in Cornwall, if yeah. you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. 90% yeah. of Cornish people are incredibly passionate about where they're from yeah. and anyone that takes an interest in their in their uh, their little patch of mm. heaven you know yeah. they they yeah. want to welcome them and make sure they have a good time well, yeah. i think that's the interest the, the important thing you know to, that uh, i felt that people should understand ab about cornwall and 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 your place in in um, you know what the reason we're talking to you is that um, there are places off the beaten track that mm -hmm. you um, you know you know the place and you're able to illustrate mm -hmm. places that yeah. people would never get to see otherwise. Yeah, and, and that was another driving force for me yeah. uh, writing the blog as well was to highlight those places because um, I find that Cornwall tends to get that you tend to get. Uh, the same few places highlighted by, by yeah. the press and, and by yeah. tourist, uh, the tourist industry, you know, and everybody ends up going to the same beaches and, and the same uh, attractions. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. The, the, the sort of underlying point of, of well, what that's, I that's do something is to that, highlight. Uh, you know, I think we, we feel exactly the same about that. It doesn't matter where you go, that there's the, 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 the it, it's a bit like, you know, we've said, you know, for ages that, you know, out of all the sites there are across Britain, everybody knows Stonehenge and that's it. You know, for so many people, that's it. <laughs> yeah. um, but looking at Cornwall then as a whole, bearing in mind, you know, what, what we share uh, is our desire to get prehistory out to a wider mm. audience, to tell people about sites that they don't know and stuff yeah. like that. So, for you looking at Cornwall, what are, what are the what are your top places that you wish people knew more about, or you wish oh. that they knew that they were there? <laughs> and oh, why? I see. I always get myself into trouble with these things because um, there are some people that go, <laughs> "Why are you telling everybody? Stop it!" <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Do you know so, we had that feeling doing standing standing with stones actually? You know, yeah. really? sort of double edged sword yeah. slightly. Sorry, interrupted yeah. you there, no. Lizzie. I'm like, carry no, on. Yeah, you. so I, I do tend to get you know people that um, are a little bit tentative about advertising these places, but mm. I can't see that there's going to be hordes of people. You know, uh, it's it's only the dedicated people that are prepared to put the walk in. <laughs> You know, yeah, and so exactly. so it's 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 not yeah. the uh, it's not the awful thing that some people and battle think. with the brambles and the gorse exactly. and you know the stinging yeah. nettles and yeah. and all of that. So yeah, yeah I I don't know. It's re always really difficult for me to narrow down, um, you know, my my favourite places to visit mm -hmm. or. But you're going to. Um, aren't you? <laughs> I will try. I don't know where to start, really. Um, I suppose that a place that I wrote about quite recently, um, I don't know if you would have seen it, it was Dros uh, Droskin Point. I, uh, I reshared that post on, on Twitter this morning because I suddenly thought I, I really enjoyed that day. Yeah. And it was mm -hmm. uh, back in March, I think, February or March. And um, again, I was reading something and this popped up as like the oldest mine in Cornwall. And of course, I'm yeah. like, the what now? Where is this? <laughs> so you know, jump in the car and, and go and find it. And um, if you ha if you guys haven't read it, it's uh, uh, sort of in a cliff face um, okay. overhanging the sea near yeah. Perranporth, and there's these mining galleries which yeah. are basically being cut directly out of the the cliff face yeah. to mm -hmm. get the tin that was close to the yeah. surface then. Yeah. And <clears throat> they're thought to be about two thousand years old, okay. maybe mm -hmm. a bit older yeah. than that. Um, and I just think they're just 
amazing because you can go right up to that rock face and you can see the tool mark yeah. still in, in the stone yeah, yeah. After, after 2,000 that's years. And that, to me, is just incredible. Yeah. I love that that tangible connection mm. to yeah. mm. the people that were there before you. Um, that really, yeah, that really but excites they, me. But <laughs> um, a bit mining the tin for far further back than that mm. we were talking mm. um just last week uh, yeah. about um a particular stone circle in the south of ireland in on the brera peninsula uh, you know and they were mining stuff there to combine yeah. with cornish tin to make uh, yeah. make your, your your bronze really really yeah important. i mean uh, and obviously in streaming yeah. went back further again than yeah. that you know because it, it, it's so rich down here you could yeah. literally pick it up yeah. off the surface yeah you know, this amazing. was just the evidence where where they were um mining it intentionally from from the cliff face yeah but actually, then you see that there's layers of history with, yeah. with that place because after that um it was used by smugglers uh, yeah, so yeah. during the 19th century yeah. to uh, squirrel away their their contraband um yes. so and I, I that's one thing i enjoy finding out about these places is the yeah. those different layers of history while we're talking touching on the subject of of metals what is the connection with the nebra sky disc oh yes yeah um that was uh i can't remember if it was a newspaper article i read um but i was just sitting at home one evening with the other half and i went i've just read the most amazing thing and told him <laughs> about this uh nebra sky disc and he just said to me well let's go and i was like yeah. what <laughs> and he's like well do you want to see it i was like yeah so <laughs> we we booked like a, an easy jet flight to berlin and took the train um to Halle in Dasala. and uh it's in a, a little museum like the little town museum yeah yeah but it is if you haven't seen it it is the most amazing object yeah. i mean it's stunning I was yes. I was completely blown away, completely yeah. floored by it. I've forgotten the date the gold, on it. It's, it's Bronze four, Age, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's four thousand plus, I think. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And and the connection with Cornwall yeah. um, is is the gold yeah. in in the disc um, that was used to represent the stars, etc. Yeah. Um, mm. Was actually they've they've traced it somehow with yeah. their magical they have ways and means <laughs> yes <laughs> technology and they've traced it right back to uh, the Carnan Valley which is just you know a matter of miles from me a couple of oh, miles oh that is brilliant and, yeah and yeah and the tin uh, yeah. in it as well was traced back to to Cornwall which i always find that incredible you know i think we've spoken about it before that uh, that movement of, of people and objects sure, in, that, yeah. in that time period. Um, you know, we, we think of it all being as very sort of, I don't know if I'm going to use the right word as backward is not what I want to say, but in, probably <laughs> ins, insular, maybe insular, insular is the, the better word. word. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Isolated. And of course, <laughs> isolated. And of course it, it wasn't at all, you know, no, <clears throat> Yeah, it's true. Uh, I mean, historically speaking, you know, we know about the wealth of trade that uh, was coming from uh, from the Romans coming into Cornwall for minerals. So, uh, so there's absolutely no question that it extended uh, back, you know, quite a long way mm. prior to that. Uh, yeah. And it's uh, it's amazing actually when you you look at things. Uh, I mean, Grimes Graves. Uh, um, you know, amongst all the flints and what have you, they found a greenstone axe there, beautiful polished greenstone axe that was from Cornwall. Yeah. So uh, you know, <laughs> clearly Cornwall has been making its mark uh, from a from a trading and exchange point of view. Cornwall's been making its mark uh, around the British Isles yeah. uh, for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. And yeah. talking of uh, trading and exchange, that kind of rings a bell for me because uh, there are more than one double or triple, even triple, stone circles on mm. Bodmin Moor mm. and elsewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously the hurlers. I mean, I can only think of I, I'm the triple one of the hurlers, but you know mm. more, Liz. I don't know if, a, uh, well, triple is debatable. There's a, a stone circle down uh, on the Penwith Trigger Seal. Yeah. That I've I've read somewhere that there could have been, well, there were definitely two and there might have been three yeah. um, mm. stone circles there. Yeah. There's more pairs, there's more twin 
yeah. stone circles. So there's emblems um, on oh, King Arthur's down. Yes. There's, there's uh, um, twin there. And then there's yeah. Les, Ker- Les Kernick uh, Hill. Mm. Where there's uh, two stone circles and a, and a stone row. Yeah. Um, and I was involved actually about five years ago um, in uncovering the stones at, uh, at Les Kernick, actually. I work... Uh, with a team of uh, mostly old old gentlemen um, that we call ourselves. A, I'm sure a I don't t- know what you mean. Mean. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they're they're the time time seekers uh, run by a chap called Roy, um, and they invited me to join them um, through a blog post that I wrote actually yeah. that that Roy has oh, nice. read, and um, so I've been working with them on and off now for about five years, I think. Um, and they are a clearance team up on okay. Bobbin Moor. Um, and stones like Les Koenig, all the stones are recumbent. So, yeah. um, And yeah. the first time I tried to see Les, K- um, Les Koenig stone circles, I ended up wandering around the moor for a good two hours before giving up <laughs> and going home. Uh, because Bobbin where they're, yeah, where they're marked about, yeah. on the old OS map is not quite right. <laughs> and because they're all recumbent... Yeah. There's no way of finding them. Yeah. So what we do as a clearance team is we go around and remove the turf yeah. um, from from the stones. And it's all done um, in cahoots with Cornwall Archaeological Unit and I was going to um, say English Heritage sort of and Na- Natural yeah. England. Yeah. And Natural England give us advice on, on how to... We, we replace the turf into um, like the dips in the ground that the cattle make and things yeah. like that, just so that oh, okay. all the yeah. wildflowers and everything is, is looked after. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we uh, the first job that I did with them was uncovering the the um, two stone circles and the stone row. And the stone row, yeah, yeah, I think I'm right in saying had been sort of lost. Really, it had yeah. been sort of partially recorded, but then no yeah. one really had any record of exactly where it was. And um, yeah. yeah, we we basically uncovered it. It's really it's interesting. An amazing site. Uh, uh, Les Koenig has a whole. There's a book um, about the site own world yeah. and um it's an amazing site because not only have you got the stu- two circles in the stone row you've also got um yeah. cairns and you've got a propped stone and then you've got numerous hut, st- hut circles and um field enclosures all so over a real the complex and you know, yeah. it's interesting yeah. because i think the impression so many people get is that the, the sites are uh, isolated and singular but mm. it's at sites like that you really get a, a, a sense of yeah. things going on, of busyness of yeah. some sort mm. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. going on. And a on. busyness for a very long period of time. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. For generations and generations of people. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's something, you know, we, we, we should take on board next time we take a, a longer look at uh, Cornwall or even, even come down. Uh, yes, you know, try and emphasize yes, that fact, point. We'll, we'll, a bit we'll more. do that. We'll we'll come down and we'll visit you, and you can do, you can. I take would us, love uh, that. You yeah, that would be around. amazing. Yeah, I would yeah, love absolutely. that. I would be a happy bunny if I, yeah, I yeah. could if I could plan a day where all I had to do was take you guys out and entertain you with the, 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 the strange fat, fat, and fat. wonderful we, sights of Cornwall. We'll, 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 we'll make a point of doing that. You Fantastic. don't know what you've let yourself in for. <laughs> Uh, you know, I have to say that uh, you know, reading your blogs, I mean, it was uh, it was actually a, a joy for me because you've you've written about sites that, uh, that I, you know I have to say I'd never heard of them. Yeah, yeah. And and one of them in particular, Emblance, which I, mm. I had not heard of Emblance, and uh, quite intrigued by that because you know obviously as you're just saying, um, albeit not about Emblance, but you know a lot going on and yeah. one of the things that intrigued me there is that there's a there's a stone there one of the uh, monoliths that mm. i haven't seen another stone exactly like that albeit this is an awful lot shorter but it's the same overall sort of shape as the stones up on stennis and i've never seen that that's on orkney and i've i've never oh, seen it seen. anywhere else where something looks as if it has so deliberately been chosen because of its shape, because yeah, of its yeah, angularity. There is a, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, and uh, there is a lot of that, I think, on Bobmin Moor. I've had discussions oh, with Roy yeah. of of the Time Seekers about this before. Um, he has a a, a theory um, about the stone circles on Bobmin Moor, um, 
and I'm fishing for it in my head a little bit, but <laughs> there are uh, a lot of um, what he calls tri-stones, so sort of triangular-shaped oh, stones. See. And yeah. he feels that these stones are particularly positioned facing Rao Tor, ah. so that they are sort of mirroring okay. mirroring the shape of, of that Tor with, oh, within the, the circle. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't okay. know. But very, it's, yeah, very it's, a, it's a theory, yeah. I um, I noted, uh, I, I think you're talking about some of the hut circles and some of the settlements there. Yeah. You know, sort of, you know, we come back to this wonderful thing of, of dating. Um, mm. That, you know, they have seemed to have been dated to the Bronze Age, which kind of makes sense because that's when all the activity probably was going on around mm. uh, extracting um, tin, um, et cetera. Um, I just thinking back. Uh, time team um, went to Rautor and concentrated on the. Um, I, I think it was the sort of north east slope. There's a mm. uh, sort of um, hut circles and uh, other enclosures uh, down and there. And the Long Cairn. The, that's yeah. the yeah exactly yeah. that. Um, not far from the Long Cairn, and I think they got ecstatic about um, three quarters of the way through, um, somebody found a piece of flint. I don't know how you're going to get a date from that, but they reckon that that pushed it back into the Neolithic. Yeah. So, you know, fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think we all, as we were saying about Les Koenig, you have to bear in mind that, you know, these things weren't just didn't just pop up one day yeah, yeah, and then yeah. people walked off and forgot about them the next day. You know, yeah, they, yeah. The, the ground was probably used by subsequent generations for a, a, probably a much longer time than we appreciate. Actually, interestingly, you know, that you'd, you've been sort of painstakingly kind of avoided the places that uh, people already know. So <laughs> I, I can't yeah. recall seeing you writing a piece about the hurlers, for example. No, you know, which, which, I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> which is no. kind of in that vein, well, isn't you know, it? you kind of um, you want to say things that other people aren't saying, yeah. don't yeah, you? Yeah, There's yeah. no yes. point in going back over the same stuff. Yeah. I mean... I do to a certain extent because I, I love to bring in sort of antiquarian writers, uh, people, you know, like Borlase or, or, you know, even yeah. people in, in the last sort of last 20 or 30 years. I like when I'm writing about a place to bring in as many different sources um, as I can, yeah. you know, to to give sort of a wider picture of people's impressions of, of, of that place. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't want to be going over. There's no point in me writing about... Um, St. Michael's yeah. Mount, because it's, <laughs> yes. you know, yeah. we couldn't agree more. It's it's about showing people stuff that they don't know about. That's, yeah. that's the whole yeah. thing, isn't it? And it's yeah. about yeah. Yeah. the things that I discover as well. You know, obviously, mm. I'm I'm born and bred here. I've lived the majority of my life um, in Cornwall, but mm. I am always discovering uh, yeah. new stuff. Yeah. And uh, when I started the blog, I thought there was a possibility that I would sort of run out of ideas. I would run yeah. out of things <laughs> to write about. Uh -huh. But quite clearly not, because, yeah. you know, new things pop up all mm. the time, um, like the, the cup mark yeah. the stones that I was telling you about. Oh, yes. Say before. more about those. Yeah. So it was last last autumn. Um, I was researching something else and came across a archaeological report that mentioned these cup mark stones at Stythians and mm. um I always uh, think of this sort of central area of, of Cornwall, sort of the, the, the Red Ruth, Camborne, um, you know, Truro, Falmouth area as being mm. quite devoid of, of prehistoric uh, remains. Or, mm -hmm. um, but I'm coming to realise, actually, with the, the more I learn, that that's probably probably that the case is that there was a lot more here hmm. it's just been destroyed by the amount of industry that there was in this yeah. area um there was uh quite a large um um logan rock near me uh, near constantine mm -hmm. that was sort of blown up by the local quarry in about 1860 you know it was kind of like oops <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and there was also a, a standing stone which was the biggest standing stone in Cornwall. Don't ask me how tall it was, I can't remember, but it was recorded as the largest. Oh, and uh -huh. it got broken up and made into about 20 different gateposts. 
uh, wow. again in, in the 19th 20? century. Yeah, wow. so it was ridiculously big. You can yeah. uh, find it online. But um, so I'm always learning about different stuff that was around yeah. me. So when I read about this, these cup marked stones um, in Stythians, I thought I've never heard of this. So did a bit more digging and um, found out where they were supposed to be um, and just drove over there one afternoon. So the, there was a dam that was built at Stythians right. in the 1960s and the dam covered about 300 acres of farmland um, in, in a, a shallow valley. And um, in the 1980s, um, we had a very dry summer and a gentleman that happened to just be uh, part of Cornwall Archaeological Unit, a, a guy called I think it was Don Cave, he was walking around the, the perimeter of the lake and just stumbled across these these cup marked stones that nobody knew existed. Um, and what has sort of transpired since is that when the ground was flooded, um, they were in an area of land that had never been cultivated because it was mm. really rocky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, nice. and it was the action of the water that uncovered these these cup marked stones. So oh, without okay. actually them being covered by by the, the reservoir, we would never have known that they were there. Mm. Um, nice. Yeah, so um, they did some uh, excavations sort of there in the 1980s and found an awful lot of flint. Yeah. Um, I think there's oh. some pieces of axe heads found yeah, yeah. and these three areas of cut mark stones. Um, yeah. yeah, which are uh, I think are amazing. I mean, they're, they, they're not the most impressive sight to see, you know. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you've seen any pictures of them, but they are, you know, slabs of rock with yeah, these yeah. round, <laughs> round holes yeah, cut in you know, them. But there are but, people out there that are serious about this stuff. I know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm one of them, you know, I get, I get very excited about these things. And uh, yeah, yeah. I just uh, I just took myself off there with no expectation, actually, of, yeah. of finding them at all, um, because... I knew that the water was supposed to be at a certain level yeah. and, you know, and I only had a vague idea um, and it's a big lake and I only had a vague mm -hmm. idea about where they where they were. But I did find them. So, well, yeah, it was amazing. Like I say, and then Cornwall is still me. still the kind of place where you <laughs> can go and have that adventure <laughs> of, of discovery yeah. where you're not quite sure whether you're going to get there or not. <laughs> and the 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 pleasure in finding a place that yeah. you know on the ordnance survey map looks a little bit obscure you know yeah. and you arrive at it said it said uh, uh, nine stones and there are not nine stones that's something else you <laughs> think you're in the wrong place <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and you think oh my oh my goodness i am lost no you're yeah. actually in the right place <laughs> yeah that's and, a t-shirt we have worn many a time, time. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, yeah so no you can still have that adventure but you've also got this um, choice of landscape to do it in you can do mm. it in the you know in, in the wilds of uh, of bodmin or you can find yourself struggling through undergrowth and gorse um yeah you know finding somewhere like busco and Un or one or the yeah. other or have yeah. beautiful or views out to sea exactly uh, like all that you know, yeah it's Barrow, just yeah. uh, it's a gorgeous county it really yeah. is and and uh, i think Partly because it, it is, it, you know, you only go to Cornwall because you want to go to Cornwall. You're not driving through it to go anywhere else, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so it's it's one of the the lovely aspects about many of the sites in Cornwall is that more than anywhere else you're going to have them to yourself. So it so you do feel as if you you know even if it's on the map you know you feel as if you've discovered something when you walk yeah, into these places. Yeah. It's so evocative and. Um, yeah. yeah, and I would I, just, I would uh, suggest that people come out of season as well. I yeah, know that there's yeah. a huge risk in that because in Cornwall we, we do like the rain. I mean, we go in for all <laughs> kinds of rain, mm -hmm. um, but out of season, uh, especially sort of autumn, early spring, yeah. you yeah. can still have some really lovely mild weather. Oh yeah, and you've still got the longer days, and you haven't got the visitor numbers. Yeah. Um, clogging up the roads in the same way. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, for people so that haven't been to Cornwall, um, mm. there is a particular quality of light down there that gives the <laughs> landscape a certain, um, yeah, yeah, luminescence, shall I say, uh, yeah. something like mm. that. Not yeah, too extreme I used to, to say, say, actually, that uh, 
you could sort of drop me down somewhere and I would know that it was a yeah. Cornish sky. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't know yeah. if I that know makes sense. Got, but got it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. yeah. Mm -mm. so go on then what, what is your favorite site in the whole of the county oh that's just a mean question <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right well, that, we, you know, we could put it another way um i don't know is there a site that you find yourself visiting slightly more than anywhere else oh that's an interesting mm. way of putting it yeah. mm. you'd have to look at the stats oh, here <laughs> yeah it's uh, oh it, <laughs> It depends where I. This is going to sound insane. Depends where I am. <laughs> no, no. I, what I mean by that is, yeah, it depends yeah. whether I'm down west or whether I'm up on Bodmin Moor. Yeah, then, uh -huh. and, and that tends to be. I mean, Bodmin Moor is a good hour's drive um, yeah. for me, but um, I just love it up there. Mm -hmm. I, I love the wide open spaces and those yeah. big horizons yeah um and you know because i'm a slightly antisocial bugger i <laughs> <laughs> i like being on my own yeah. um and you know i take i take a lot of pleasure in that and uh of, yeah. of picking one it would be really difficult yeah. for me well can um, you take that as an answer actually because mm. uh, there is a particular quality to to bod me more and the fact that <laughs> if you go on to bod me more that uh, even if you don't know it, you're probably walking over any number of archaeological for sure, and prehistoric for sure. remains. The amount yeah. of times that I have been walking and just thought, "Oh my God, there's a hut circle right there." Yes, I mean they're just yeah. Yeah. they're just everywhere on, on yeah, the moor, yeah. and, it's and such the views a, and such things yeah. as the the formations on the top of the tours, the yeah. the uh, cheese ring, and uh, yeah. on top of Rautor and mm -hmm. uh, and the others. They are fascinating. Yeah. They are, and I, I, uh, I think that they were in themselves incredibly important to the people that lived in and around them. That well, they well, were che cheese ring, as, both cheese ring and yeah, Rautor but had I'm, settlements I'm talking at the about top, the tours as well. Yeah. I'm talking about um, even the lesser known tours. You know, one of my favourites is Kilmer Tour, mm -hmm. and it's just stunning. I mean, mm. and there's this huge stack of rocks on there as well, very similar. Yeah to the cheese rings. Mm. And I can't imagine anybody living in and around uh, that environment, yeah. not looking up at those tours oh. and thinking, wow, you know, yeah. that they, they must have made such an impression on, yeah, on their yeah. daily lives, I think. Yeah, for those yeah. that don't know, that, I mean, they look like stacked, flattish uh, rocks, yes. but in actual fact, they're the results of uh, uh, millions of years of, of wind mm. erosion uh, on, mm. yeah. on, on those. Um, on that stone yay yeah. no that's that's great i th i think it was kind of mission accomplished that because we we with you know with your help we've painted a slightly different picture for people yeah. you know next time if they've never visited cornwall before or the next time they visit they'll just have a different perspective you know yeah. which to, with which yes. to approach yeah, and, and don't be afraid to try and hunt these different things out you know when when oh, yeah. you see that little dot on on the uh, on the ordnance survey map if anybody still uses those i do i don't know and Absolutely. it says and it says standing stone you know mm. just go and see if you can find it why yeah, not yes. you know yeah, yeah. absolutely it guaranteed a little adv adventure yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so what's uh, next for you lizzie what's next for me i don't know i mean more writing i suppose um, yeah. i'm gradually you know since i graduated i um, I've been working freelance um, yeah. as a writer, so I write for a local newspaper um, in my local town and uh, mm. just write a column for them. And um, I wrote for a magazine, uh, my Cornwall magazine as well, yeah. um, mm -hmm. doing odds and sods all the time for, yeah. for different yeah, people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's just building, building on that, I suppose. And the blog is always going to be uh, an integral part. And yeah. the search think, people yeah. do to find your blog is? That's Cornish Bird Blog. Cornish Bird, um, yeah. yeah. I'm easy to find. Well, we're going to have great delight in, in pointing people in your direction because yeah. uh, you, you. you do write beautifully and, uh, you know, and it, it's, very kind. it's nice you. to have sites brought to life like that. So, uh, and for yeah. sure we should collaborate on something. It would yeah. be fun. We will, we will come down. <laughs> we will, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> We are we are making plans for 2021. So oh, yes, okay, you know, okay, yeah, because 2020 be is going to be a bit of a, a washout. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, plans are up in the air for this year. Plans yeah. for next year will be uh, will be a bit more fun. Yeah. So well, thank you so much, Lizzie. It's been yeah. a joy talking to you, and thank you. Uh, look forward to uh, uh, to new writings that you do, and uh, <laughs> and we will keep in touch, and we will see you next year. Yes, yeah. I hope so. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for having me. It's been great fun. It's a fun. pleasure. Deep pleasure. Thank you. Listeners, thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed that. See you next time. Bye. See you next time, folks. Bye. Thank you for watching this Prehistory Guys show. There's loads more to watch, and you can get to some of it on this playlist here. If you'd like to receive updates about when we publish new content, hit the subscribe button, and you can unlock even more content by becoming a Patreon supporter. Hit this button here to find out more about that. See you soon.